Episode 181, Reebok. Ah, oh, those are all, all harmless jokes. Oh, harmless. Stefan eyed Alex in disdain. His smoldering phoenix eyes rippled with lights that shot cuttingly at him. This, this... Alex faltered. He was unable to continue. Stefan chortled. Dropping his voice, he spoke in a lukewarm tone. Mr. Wheeler, since you act like this, how can I be assured of our partnership? Alex was stunned. Clearly, he did not anticipate him saying that. His complexion promptly turned wan, and as he raised his head, he was met by the apathy on Stefan's superbly winsome face. Mr. Lewis, what do you mean? Was he possibly going to pull out of their partnership? What large-scale joke was he cracking? He placed heavy emphasis on this investment, this large-scale production, to provide them with handsome benefits. Once he put in his money, he could receive large returns. Across the capital, only Stefan had this much influence and vigor. However, just because of a woman, he could easily put a stop to their collaboration. Done with transferring the investments for this production, he just needed the ghost signal to proceed with the shooting. What? He was not the only one shocked by the sudden development. Samika, who was standing beside the man, was startled as well. She had also never seen him cast away his partnership for a woman before. Even Rima, who was used to him doing what he desired, was astonished. She could not help shifting her eyes to Monica in his embrace. She thought that the girl was indeed a special existence to her boss. It seemed she had not made a mistake shielding her earlier. You should know what I mean. He never repeated the same thing twice. He was absolutely disgusted with the ugly face he had used to stare at his woman. It was extremely sickening. Despite losing this collaborator... There were still plenty more fish in the sea. He could just choose among those waiting in line, and the production would not be affected by his removal. Alex was then flustered. Mr. Lewis, if there's a slight misunderstanding, let's just talk it through first, all right? Why drive me up the wall for this gal? Stefan leered at him indifferently. He smirked, but did not bother answering. Thus, without taking another look at him, he haughtily cuddled her away from them. He had no intention to save him faith. His resolute look was truly domineering. Semika stared directly at Stefan's left back. She wanted to follow him, but if she were to do that, she would not look reserved anymore. She could not help feeling a little stifled. Without her realizing it, her hands had balled up into fists. Something seemed to fleet in her eyes and her brows gradually creased. After the man was well out of earshot, Alex's stiff smile vanished entirely as he surveyed Rima and Semika with furrowed brows. He gritted his teeth and lashed out at them. What bullshit is this? Damn it! He ended our partnership with just those simple words. Is that woman more important to him than our collaboration? Rima put up a faint smile and simply said, Mr. Wheeler, I've warned you repeatedly, haven't I? This girl is not to be touched, for she's someone consequential to my boss, but you refused to heed my words from the start. Now, things have turned out to become like this, haven't they? Alex was a vigorous man, and had just momentarily lost his temper. However, adding insult to his injury, the secretary dared to laugh at his plight. He was really maddened now. Rima... Now that my partnership is muddled, you've got the nerve to gloat about it. The secretary gave a restrained smile. I wouldn't dare. Despite what she had just said, her heart was actually singing with happiness. The smile on her face was so obnoxious in his eyes. Now, even a lowly assistant was laughing at him. He let loose his temper and shouted in the direction of Stefan. To damn with your arrogance! Do you think I care about our collaboration? What a load of bullshit! When Semika heard this, 
she turned to glare at him before coldly telling him off. Mr. Wheeler, you're a businessman, so you'd better watch your words. And don't burn all your bridges. Is it for you to criticize Stefan? The man looked at her and wanted to rebuff, but decided against it. The Seneca was no simple folk, despite not being in the same league of power as Stefan. She already had tons of benefits lined up for her, even though her career had yet to take off officially. This was clearly because she had the support of her father, who was a top executive at Foxconn. This alone was enough to elevate her status. Alex could not help but curse. That's just a woman. Did that chap have to do this to me? I've been putting so much effort into this collaboration for so long. Mr. Wheeler, again, I advise that you watch your words. You only lost the potential to be a partner this time. But if Mr. Lewis catches wind of your words now, do you think you can continue surviving in the capital in the future? That got his attention. With his face still fuming red and hot, he gave a loud snort, and then he stormed off. Rima and Semika looked at each other and gave a smile as a form of greeting. Although she was of a high status, she knew how to display a respectful attitude to Rima, who was a faithful subordinate of Stefan, as she politely asked, Sister Rima, who is that woman? The assistant was about to answer her honestly, but she seemed to have misgivings, so she gave a different reply. She's just a small-time actress in the company. Nothing for you to worry about. Her answer was vague and ambiguous. It was no surprise for her to be wary of this Semica. For one, this woman was well known in the entertainment circle for being cruel, especially against any newcomer she deemed as a threat. There was a rumor saying that she slapped a newbie publicly when the latter badmouthed her. In the end, that poor girl had to wear a mask in her performance due to a swollen face. Rima might not know her intention, but she could guess as much. This woman did not come to Foxconn for fame, but for another reason. She definitely did not wish for Monica to unknowingly offend such a conniving woman before she could get a chance to establish her acting career. Semika was a woman whom no one could afford to offend. Episode 182 Do You Like Me? Semika lightly smiled at the vague reply and did not pursue the matter further. She just continued, I was planning to enjoy this night with Mr. Lewis, but it is a total scrap now. I'm very unhappy. Pausing, she slowed down her pace and made it clear to the assistant. Since that woman was brought here by you, then... I don't wish for a repeat of this. Rima should know what to do, right? Rima slowly nodded. She could barely keep the smile on her face as her heart sang. These words were powerful indeed. The evening wind was chilly as night descended. As the car sped on the road, Monica's face still looked ashen, while Stefan's visage was a mask of gloom. She was almost dragged the whole way half cuddled by him. She was forcefully held into his tight and strong embrace as if they were one. She lifted her head to see the man's colder than usual face. He seemed angry for reasons unknown to her. As for her, her heart had turned cold from Rima and Alex's exchange. Stefan carried her to the back seat. After closing the door, the chauffeur started the streamlined sports car and then it fled out of the complex entrance. Once she managed to sit herself firmly, she struggled out of his grip. She awkwardly turned her face away from him, yet occasionally stole futile glances at him. He was sitting gracefully in the car, but the slight frown on his brows reminded her of the calmness before the storm. Her face had unknowingly stiffened at the look on his face. Her heart sank like a heavy rock, and her hands turned a bit clammy as she clutched the genuine leather seat tightly. Stefan shot her a cold glance before saying, Come over here. His lips had the ghost of a smile. She sipped her lips for remain in her position. 
she was unwilling to draw near him. Moreover, he was displaying such a fearsome aura today. She was afraid she would be hurt by his overpowering presence. Apparently, the man was antagonized by her stubborn behavior. I don't repeat my words. He narrowed his eyes threateningly. His voice was dangerously low, and one of his sword-like brows was raised loftily. She was stunned into moving a few inches closer. Yet, the unsatisfied man jerked her by the arm all the way to him. With his big palm, he pinched her chin hard and looked deeply into her charming eyes. His smile became even more profound. He nonchalantly asked, Have you been flirting with others while I'm not around? He bowed his head to look at her. And what a besotting face she had. That look on her face, so enrapturing and seductive, it really grounded his mind. He was pining for her, even though he had not seen her for only two days. As he held her in his arms, a burning sensation of lust sparked within him. His hormones were stirred, and he had the urge to do her there and then in the car. However, he was rather stingy in this aspect. He did not want to share her best before everyone. Her beauty could only be displayed before him and no one else. Therefore, once his thoughts returned to how that old man had tried to covet her with his lustful eyes and dirty hands, he became utterly irritated. If he had not happened to have dinner in the same restaurant, this little thing would have been snatched away by someone else from him. That Alex Wheeler was cunning and evil. Once he saw a woman he wanted, he would get his hands on her at any cost. He knew that fooling around with women was the norm for someone with Alex's status. Sometimes, during the course of their business dealings, he would send some actresses to keep him company. Did that man have the impression that he could touch any woman as long as she was from his company after their few dealings? Stefan's eyes flashed dangerously. For a couple of minutes, Monica was astounded. But when she got what he was implying, her face turned white as she vigorously shook her head. He said she was flirting with others. I did not, she denied vehemently. When did she seduce anyone? He had, again, baselessly accused her of an action she did not commit. He did know that she was not a flirtatious woman, but he thoroughly enjoyed teasing her. He was fond of the way her eyes turned fierce and coquettish when she flared up like an angry kitten. It was as if she would pounce on him at any further provocation. This was a bad hobby of his indeed. Though he knew this deep in his heart, he still could not stop teasing her like this and observing the angry look on her typically calm and composed profile. He gave her a slight smile as his well-proportioned arms pulled her over to sit on his lap. Tell me, what would you do if I weren't there earlier? Would you go with him? I wouldn't. Why would I go with that man? You're lying. With a devilish smile, his broad palm held her nape as he drew close to her ear and breathed. If I hadn't shown up then, you would have left with him, right? She bit her lower lip. She was about to open her mouth to answer, but consciously realized how intimately close they were sitting. Their bodies were piled close to each other without a gap. Her face immediately heated up, which quickly spread to her fair, tender neck. She consciously pulled away from him, only to find him hugging her back into his embrace. Say, I won't! Why not? He pressed on. She rebuked. No means no! You seem to dislike me. Why? His tone was soft and light when he asked this question. This deep, dramatic, and enchanting. In what way have I not satisfied you? His warm breath from the nose burned her cute little earlobe. She pouted and turned her face away, but his palm grabbed and pulled it toward him again. His orbs dimmed as he lowered his head to lick her lip flaps gently with his tongue. They tasted sweet as usual. Answer me. She bit her lower lip, seemingly lost for words. The palm on the back of her neck jerked suddenly, and her face was helplessly pushed close to his. Her heart hastened its pace without warning, she watched his beautiful profile next to hers. Still bowing his head, 
He covered his cool lips on her small mouth tightly. He then icily asked, Do you like that old man? She wanted to shake her head, but her neck was clenched tightly by his palm. With his lip unceremoniously covering hers, she could not move an inch at that moment. He admired the desperation in her eyes before he flirtatiously moved his brows and breathed. Or do you like me? She was stunned by the question and subconsciously wanted to deny that, too. Why would she like such a cold-blooded man like him? Seeing her non-reaction, he laughed evilly and demanded, indisputably, Answer me. Episode 183 Who Dares to Touch You? Seeing her non-reaction, he laughed evilly and demanded, indisputably, Answer me. Monica wanted to refuse to answer him, but when she noticed his large palm audaciously slipping inside her dress, she hastily threw a glance at one side of the car. The driver was driving along and was seemingly blind and deaf to the movements in the back seat. He did not even flip the corner of his eyes at the rearview mirror. She would nervously peek in the driver's direction at the man's every action. The chauffeur seemed to notice her concern and proceeded to press a button that raised the partition between the front seat and the back cabin. Despite that, she was still fearful. Don't! She grabbed his wrist with her hand and whispered pleadingly, Don't do it here! It was clear that she had given in this time from her words. He was unsatisfied by her reply, though. Holding her hand in response, he continued his action on her fingertip. She felt bashful and frustrated. She tried to struggle out of his hold, but his wrist power proved to be too strong for her. Thus, as a peace offering, she initiatively reached her hand to cuddle his nape and then gave his lips a light kiss. Answer me. Stefan was like the devil the way he refused to relent. If not, I'll do you inside the car. Monica was taken aback by his threat, seeing the mischief dancing in his eyes, knew without a doubt that he would really do it. Biting her lower lip, she mumbled, I like... like you. Mixed emotions were interwoven in her eyes, and what she had just said was against her conscience. This only seemed to draw the man to tease her further. He took a wanton hide between her clavicles, and sat back to admire her crimson look from anxiety. His voice turned hushed and gentle as he asked again, What do you like about me? Huh? She lifted her startled eyes and stared into his piercing orbs. Say, what do you like about me? The man grinned a little as he grabbed her hand and guided it all the way to that part between her thighs. Here? Her fingertips jolted from the spot as if she had just been scalded. She retracted her hand forcefully as she spouted with some difficulty. No, don't do that. His eyes were fixated on her visage as hers were also gazing at his handsome profile. Right now, she felt cheap and dirty. Alex's invasive and humiliating words faintly reverberated in her ears. She suddenly wondered if she was such a woman in this man's heart. She was cheap, like a piece of goods affixed with a price tag and ready to be traded by anyone. For reasons unknown, she seemed to care what he thought of her. The man stopped smiling when he saw her solemn expression. She looked sad and forlorn. He thought of Alex and what that man might have said to her that made her throw such a wistful look at him now. He pinched her chin and worried that he might hurt her, loosened his grip somewhat as he asked in a hushed tone, What did he say to you? She found that man's filthy words hard to express, but looking at his sullen face, she slowly let out, said nothing more, except that he wants to bed me for a night. His eyes darkened when she finished her words. When he exited the dining room in that restaurant, he was startled to hear Rima's and Alex's voices. However, as he was too far from them, 
He did not fully catch their conversation. He only heard something about that man wanting to take his little woman away. He decided to show his face after observing for a while. He was unaware that that man had measured his woman's value using the cheapest currency. She asked softly, Do I mean the same to you? A woman who comes with a price tag? Looking at his sullen face, she quickly added, I'm not a merchandise, so don't sell me to anyone else. He answered her with a ferocious kiss. Without waiting for her to finish, he slammed her mouth with his and kissed all of her broken words. His tongue ravaged her little lips and swept the insides of her mouth recklessly. His thin lips clung tightly to her little mouth. Not intending to leave her a respite, he gnawed at the tip of her tongue and wildly plundered her breath away. His gesture was so overwhelming, her brain went into overdrive, and she almost fainted right into his arms. Just as her mind was on the verge of blanking, he eased his grip on her. She draped tiredly on him as her pink lips gasped greedily for fresh air. In her groggy state, she could hear his deep voice speaking. You're my woman. Who dares to touch you? His words hid traces of haughtiness, yet unwittingly revealed an imperceptible touch of tenderness. Somehow, she was sensitive enough to pick up the tender touch that stabbed her heart slightly. She could not explain this feeling as well. Why was her heart hurting this bad, causing it to unbearably twitch again and again? Her nose stung with the thought of the man's demanding love and care for her. Somehow, it made her feel so safe protected. There was actually a tinge of sweetness arising in her heart. This man might be domineering, but it was good to be surrounded by his loving embrace. Expensive VIP Room A handsome man with devilish looks was leaning closely on the pool table as he aimed his cue ball with his cue stick at another ball. His pair of narrowed eyes gleamed demonically. Bump. With a crisp sound, the black billiard ball with the number eight shot straight into a pocket. It was a brilliant shot from an accurate angle with just the right amount of force applied. Robert Lee nonchalantly lifted himself, his slender fingers lightly caressing the cue stick as he wore a satisfied smile. Sylvester, where are you just sitting still there? You should enjoy yourself while you're here, shouldn't you? With that, he smiled and turned around. Look, I won again. You lost your chance. Ha <laughs> ha. Everyone looked at the unfathomable smile on his cold and haughty face, and each of them swallowed a gulp with great difficulty. They could only shudder in fear at this frightening man's smile. His unpredictable mood made them cower in terror. In a corner at one side, Sylvester sat on the couch, a deadly paler overspreading his face. His body slumped weakly onto the sofa as his shoulders quacked uncontrollably. At a closer look, one could see that the eyes on his lifeless face were vacuous while his body was as rigid as a puppet. Episode 184 Robert Lee, the Merciless Beside his feet quietly lay a corpse with its eyes horrifyingly wide open. Three minutes ago, this was still a living being and was one of Sylvester's bodyguards. Now, a gaping hole, dripping with blood, could be seen in his forehead between his eyebrows. He merely uttered a statement that incurred the ire of Robert and ended up in such a horrendous state. Fresh blood splattered all over the floor, filling the room with the heavy smell of blood. The skin's temperature was rapidly cooling. The terrifying atmosphere of death shrouded the vast VIP lounge. Drake looked sympathetically at Sylvester's ashen face and walked toward the pool table to line up the billiard balls. At one side, Benjamin played with a few billiard balls. The expression on his face 
revealed that he had long been accustomed to such a scene. Robert took his time to sit on the couch and lit a cigarette. A slender hand brushed away the slightly messy cringe covering his forehead. Sylvester, why don't you say something? Have we not done a good job entertaining you here? His body sank slightly onto the sofa. Beside him, two seductively sexy girls in explicit outfits immediately welcomed him in their arms. Their graceful and delicate bodies draped across his torso as they carefully held his handsome face to pepper him with kisses. He laughed lasciviously. His big palm reached beneath one of the girl's dresses without qualms, and made its way up her body, stirring her lust along the way. Sylvester looked visibly horrified. No, Robert, I wouldn't dare complain. Sylvester, how's the recovery going for your injured hand? Absorbed in fooling around with the lubricious woman sitting on his lap, Robert did not bother looking at him. Nonetheless, his voice could not hide an icy undertone. There is no issue with my hand now. If Martin ever does you an injustice, just let me know and I'll apologize on his behalf. Sylvester's face rose. He did not know if he should laugh or cry at his words. Apologize? Getting the head of the number one mafia group, the Lee family, to apologize was equivalent to wanting his life. He was deeply regretting his action now. He did not expect Martin's brother to be Robert from the most powerful Mafia family. This was a big deal. He had offended someone whom he should not have offended. He did not know the superstar's background at the start, only finding the latter as ostentatious and openly defiant. Who was Sylvester Finn? He was the godfather of Hollywood North Entertainment and a living legend. He was considered a highly influential figure in the entertainment industry. His hard-handed background and tactics meant that no one dared to offend him. The superstar was the first and the only one to do that. After the gala, Drake had personally brought a few high-level people from Foxcom Entertainment to apologize to him. He was a proud man, though, so how could he let the matter rest just like that? He told this top star manager to hand over the superstar for him to teach a lesson personally. He wanted the young man to know of his formidable position in the vast entertainment industry. The young man seemed to think that just because he had been acting for a decade and had become a superstar with overwhelming fame, he could be audacious to anyone. Even the few top executives of Foxcom had to be mindful of their old self. Alas. That Martin, who was only a mere lad, dared to defy him still. However, he was totally unprepared to discover that Martin was not that simple. The powerful Lee family was a legendary mafia group in the capital, and it had been around for hundreds of years. It could be said that the Lee was the only family comparable to the Lewis family in power. How extensive was the network of the Lee family? No one knew exactly. Although after all these years, the Lee had used unknown methods to clear their family name. In fact, there were still people from the underworld. Be it their method or style of work, they were merciless. This was especially the case with Robert Lee. The man was an extremely dangerous, scary character. He was only 23 when he ascended to the leadership of the Lee family. But upon gaining power, his ambitious and merciless nature surfaced. The second day he came to power, he removed all those section heads and henchmen that were disloyal to him. The cruelty of his methods left people trembling in fear. Compared to the man's methods, the level of Sylvester's methods was simply not entertaining enough. As the crown prince of the underworld, because of his identity, this Lee family head was shrouded in mystery. Very few people knew of his actual appearance. Rumors had it that those who had seen his actual appearance were no longer in this world. Sylvester's legs could not help but wobble. He was afraid. Why would he not be? 
He might have rampaged in the entertainment industry for years, but to wealthy mafia families like the Lee family, he still had to regard them with reverence. Robert was famous for being temperamental. His mood swings were incalculable. A truly frightening person was someone who, although wearing a smile, exuded bone-deep coldness. This was because one would never know if they would lose their life in his hands in the next second. The door was suddenly pushed ajar. Martin came in from this door. Robert raised his head, and once he realized that it was him, the corner of his lips curled up. Martin, you're here, brother. Second heir of the Lee family. Sylvester's complexion turned Watson as he scampered to fall on his knees heavily before the superstar. Under extreme fear, his thick lips chapped and quivered. Beads of cold sweat trickled from his forehead. Feeling somewhat irritated, Martin kicked his hand away. Sylvester, what are you doing here? Martin, please tell Robert that what happened between us is purely a misunderstanding. It's just a misunderstanding. Robert asked nonchalantly. Martin... Have you somehow offended Sylvester previously? Why don't you quickly apologize to him? His voice sounded extremely gentle, yet it made one's hair stand on end. Martin simply answered, Brother, I didn't. Drake said, albeit a little helpless, Mr. Lee, it's just a minor issue. It's really just a small misunderstanding. I already explained this to Mr. Finn, but he didn't want to give me a face and insisted on me handing Martin over to him. This is what this is all about. Sylvester, this appears to be your mistake, then. Robert unhurriedly stood up and paced back and forth in front of Sylvester. He shook his head and sighed. This younger brother of mine grew up overseas. He does know a lot about the rules of the underworld in the capital. He paused for a while, and then... His lips curved into a slight grin before continuing indifferently. According to the rules, as his elder brother, I'm considered as his guardian. If he ever does you any offense, come directly to me, and I'll apologize to you on his behalf. But how can you ask for a member of the Lee family to be handed over to you? If you take away my people, then where is your consideration for me, Robert? How can the prestige of my family continue to be upheld that way? Robert, I previously... I didn't know his identity, Sylvester explained. His face was a deathly pallor as he wiped away the sweat on his forehead. Episode 185 This Knot is Real Tight Robert, I previously... I did not know his identity, Sylvester explained. His face was a deathly pallor as he wiped away the sweat on his forehead. You don't know? Can't be. He elegantly leaned sideways on the billiard table. Playing with the chalk in his hand, he said in a soft voice, Clearly, you look down on me, Robert. Sylvester's expression completely changed. He drastically paled from fright and rushed to defend. Mr. Robert, you misunderstood me. Previously, I didn't know that Martin is your younger brother. The curve on Robert's lips remained, but his voice was unbelievably chilly. Ha! Huh. Sylvester, I, Robert, don't care where you come from. But the moment you stepped foot into this capital, you should have known whose territory it is. I know. I've always known. You know? You know, yet you dare snatch away my territory. Eyeing him through his peripheral, Robert stepped his polished shoe on the old man's hand with a great amount of force and demanded fiercely, Know whose name has been carved over the capital? Who do you think you are? You're in Lee territory, yet you don't follow the rules. Do you think I will tolerate you? Sylvester was in so much pain, his face lost all its color. At that moment, he thought things through again and came to realize which incident the man was talking about. His complexion instantly turned white. 
I don't dare do that, Mr. Lee. You misunderstood. I absolutely don't mean that. A great man won't remember the faults of small men. Please don't lower yourself to the same level as me. He grasped the ends of Robert's trousers as he pleaded in earnest. Little did he know that this overture had broken the man's taboo. Robert pursed his lips thinly and creased his brows in detest. Look, you've dirtied my pants. What shall be done in return? As soon as he said that, he stretched his leg out and kicked him away. Sylvester tumbled about in shame. He lay in paralysis at the corner of the table as he suffered heavy bruising from the impact. He was in such pain, he involuntarily took a gasp of cold air. His eyeballs started jerking about when he saw the man's well-trained underlings coming over to him expressionlessly. One could only hear an absolutely shrill shriek. In a flash, blood gushed forth like a river within the room. Sylvester cradled his broken arm. His entire face was swollen red from extreme pain. His battered body rolled around as he wailed pathetically. Robert spared him a cold look before turning to leave the room. Drake and Benjamin followed him. Before Martin left, he walked over to the painfully writhing old man and gripped his neck apathetically. Let me warn you, don't harbor any thoughts about her. The her he was referring to here was Monica. Sylvester, who was in a stupor from the pain, only you to nod furiously at anything. At ease, Martin also departed from the room. As soon as he was out of the room, he took out his phone and read the message Monica had sent to him. He inferred that it was already late and that she was probably back at her house now. A vehicle drove to a mountain villa. Monica glanced outside the window. The villa was completed a year ago, yet it still did not have a name. Following the man out of the vehicle, she was suddenly pulled into his arms. Her head hit his chest at once, and she furrowed her brows at the slight pain she felt. When she looked up, she only saw him laughing with mischief in his eyes. Aren't you going to send me home? She flared up in her rage. Why are we here? I miss you. Stay with me tonight, the man said. He was a little delighted to have his way. If Andres were to learn that his kindergarten's dull summer camp was orchestrated by a certain man, he would surely seethe in anger. Returning to the villa, she started to get a little restless and sat down on the sofa without moving. She observed the man, who had just taken a shower, paced back and forth in front of her leisurely. He put on a loose bathrobe and casually dried his damp hair with a towel. Her eyes could not help but stare at his slightly exposed chest. Her face began to burn at what she saw, and then she looked away. Stefan moved toward the celery to pour himself a glass of vodka. From his peripheral, he took a cold glance at the woman, who was sitting still on the sofa. She seemed to be afraid of something, and to be avoiding something. He started to roam the business market since he was 18. He had to say that some women were indeed good schemers. Even shrewd businessmen on the market had to consider themselves as inferior to them. In stark contrast, this little woman in front of him was purely simple and transparent. One could easily perceive what she was thinking from her expression. How could she hide her thoughts from him at all? He finished savoring the glass of wine in leisure. Yet, she remained frozen on the same spot, as if she were sitting on a cushion full of pins. She lowered her head and stared into space, letting her mind wander. Thus, he asked, Aren't you going to bathe? I'll do it later. I'll be waiting for you in the room. Once he said that, he entered the bedroom, minding his business, and gave no further glances at her. Monica was dazed. Her eyes followed the man into the bedroom, but even after a long time, she did not move an inch. She lay in wait for quite some time, and eventually surmised that the man had probably gone to sleep. Hence, glancing right and left, she concluded he was too tired and went to bed. She then started her exploration of the room. The spacious bedroom was connected to the lounge. A cloakroom, a bathroom, study room, 
to celebrate, and even a bar. This place had everything. She again sat on the sofa for quite a while before she walked into the bathroom. She took a quick bath with a confused heart. Before she stepped out of the bathroom, she tightened the knot on her bathrobe belt subconsciously, but she ended up tying a dead knot by accident. She was then a little more at ease. When she entered the bedroom, the wall lights were still lit. He left them on for her. However, he seemed to be fast asleep. The man, whose large physique lay sideways, occupied two-thirds of the bed. She was secretly in joy and climbed into bed carefully. She moved cautiously, worried of making any sound. Before she could lie down steadily, she felt someone turning over beside her. This movement startled her so much, her heart skipped a beat. While she was taken aback, the man stretched his hand out, pulled her toward him by force. His large palms then moved toward the knot of her bathrobe belt without her permission. He tugged on the bathroom belt, which was accidentally tied into a dead knot. The corner of his lips pulled up to form a sinister smile as he said mischievously, This knot is really tight. Her face became scalding red. Feeling somewhat embarrassed, she turned away. Episode 186 Kinship Connects the Heart Monica's cheeks became faintly rosier due to their closeness to each other. Feeling his hot breath on her ear, her body froze in that instant. Do you think I can't do anything to you because you tied a dead knot? His voice, with a teasing undertone, drew close to her ear. Nervous, she moved to shut her eyes tightly, but was unprepared for the man's next action. With a pop, the lights went off, and everything around her became shrouded in darkness. She could hear his deep bass tone behind her. Go to sleep. His hushed voice continued to sound mischievous. I'll let you off tonight. While they were merely sleeping together without doing anything more, the gloominess in his heart dissipated as he sniffed her hair's sweet fragrance. A tantalizing beauty was indeed lying in his arms at the moment, which got him hot and bothered, especially when her curvaceous body would brush against his own every now and then. He did ask himself why the need for him to suppress his urge for her sake. He could very well rip off what she was wearing, and later to his satisfaction. However, as he felt her stiff body next to his, he did not initiate any action. The lust he had suppressed in his body tempted him much, but he preferred not to think about it as he pushed the urge away. Indeed, this was his first time purposely suppressing the flaming urge in his body just to please a woman. He did this so that he would not scare her away. Oh well, he would let her off for today. Still, he needed to do something, anything, to keep his lust under control. Hence, he bowed his head, pressed hard on her mouth, and kissed her over and over again. His tongue greedily licked her lip flap. After that, he did nothing more except embrace her tightly in his arms seemingly satisfied with that. At dawn, when the first rays of the sun filtered through the gap in the window curtains, she woke up. To be precise, she was long awake, for she had been unable to fall asleep all night. The man behind her looked fast asleep, but his arms were tightly locking her in his domineering embrace. His possessive action did not allow her to break free. They were at such proximity, with his nose steadily breathing air on hers, she somehow lost her composure. She carefully struggled free from his restraints and slowly got down from the bed. She then walked into the hall and pulled open the curtains. It was already bright and shining outside. Walking past the study room, she happened to glance at a huge picture frame hanging on the wall. Curious, she tiptoed her way into the room somewhat feeling like an intruder. Hanging on the wall was an exquisite family portrait. 
In the photo, Peter Lewis, taking the seat of honor, was in the center. Beside him were Gracia Lewis, Patricia Thompson, Stefan's mother, Richard Lewis, Stefan's father, and the youth Stefan Lewis. The picture was taken in a bygone era, but well preserved, but still looked as good as new. She did not know the rest of the people in the photo, but she could identify Stefan at one glance. When he was younger, his present daunting and oppressive aura was non-existent, though he still stood out from those his age with his perfect features and shrewd eyes. His cool gaze was not much different from the present, and Andre somehow inherited this particular look in his father's eyes. Kinship was truly an amazing thing. As she was pondering on this, her peripheral view strayed on the girl standing beside Peter in the image. Her gaze slightly contracted, and her heart briefly skipped a beat. This girl looked so familiar, she seemed to have seen her before. The expression on her face, even the look in her eyes, felt strangely familiar to her. The visual was especially powerful. It looked so familiar, utterly familiar. However, the memory of her childhood was hazy, and she could not recall much of it. Numerous studies about psychology claim that to escape a dark past and protect oneself from painful memory, man could choose to forget or have selective amnesia. She had a rather dark childhood, filled with unhappiness, so she subconsciously chose to hide her past from herself in order not to revisit it again. Therefore, in the cloudy memory of her childhood days, which she had shut off her mind, she was unable to recall where she had seen this girl before. As she was feeling frustrated, her gaze fell on a photo frame on top of the study table, and her heart was instantly filled with warmth and gentleness. She took out that little picture frame featuring Sam in a handsome army uniform. Standing in a military posture, coupled with his striking countenance and full exuberance, he looked dashing in the photo. Sam was different from his younger sibling in that he was full of energy. His every move and action seemed to take after his father's valor and strength. Alas, he also inherited Stefan's haughty and mature charisma, which kept others at a distance. This image was taken a year ago when he was undergoing special military training. The uniform he was wearing was specially tailored to fit him well. His masculine build, with broad shoulders and tapered waist, was proportionate. Though he was young, he did not look out of place in the military outfit. She stared at the image in the photo for a long time. Her fingers brushed the spot where his eyes were, as something seemed to sting her chest. Sam and Andre's faces seemed to be fashioned in the same way. The two little fellows looked so alike. She pondered on this with a pout. There was a time when she could not stop thinking of this child every minute of the day. Blood was thicker than water. Kinship united their hearts. This was something not even separation could easily cut off. It would be the first of June the day after tomorrow in their birthday. She really wanted to give the little lad a gift wrapped by her two hands. As she was deep in her thoughts, conjuring wistful dreams, footsteps approached from behind without her noticing. Only when a pair of arms looped across her torso and pulled her into an embrace did she turn with a start and saw Stefan's drowsy face. He rested his chin lightly on her shoulder, looking tired and out of sorts. As he was fresh out of bed, his overpowering aura was still hibernating. His eyes did not hold their usual sharpness as well. His messy fringe slightly covered his eyes, making his already tempting looks seductive beyond words. This man still looked good even when he was down and about. It was no wonder so many women could not wait to flock to him. What are you looking at? Um, photo? He took the photo in her hand and glanced at it briefly. Oh, this was taken last year. Huh? 
This little fellow is much taller now compared to last year. How tall is he now? She eagerly checked with him. She wanted to know all she could about her son, whom she could not acknowledge. 140 centimeters. He's that tall? She was rather amazed. He's much taller than Andre's then. He lowered his head to stare at her and smilingly asked, Oh, how tall is Andre's? Episode 187 Gastric Problem Flares Up Again He lowered his head to stare at her and smilingly asked, Oh, how tall is Andres? He should be about 120 centimeters. About this tall. Monica gestured to her wrist with her palm. This figure was actually given to her by the kindergarten physician a month ago. Andres' height was considered as tall compared to kids' his age. An average boy of the same age would stand at around 110 centimeters. However, Andres' development was lacking from certain perspectives. His father's height stood at 1.9 meters, whereas her height was around 1.69 meters. For unknown reasons, although he was not much different from other boys in his age bracket, the boy's development appeared to be rather slow, and when juxtaposed with Sam, his body deficiency was apparent. Has he been taking calcium tablets? He has that every day, but his development remains sluggish. Andres' health was a constant source of heartache for Monica. I've asked the doctor before. His slow development may have something to do with his premature birth. Most preterm babies are slow in their development. He already has a weak constitution since birth. Initially, the doctor asserted that he might not live past the age of three due to his poor health. He has congenital heart deficiency, and his spleen and stomach aren't functioning well, too. In the past, I was plagued by the constant worry that I wouldn't be able to keep him. His brows furrowed slightly. He did not know that Andres' health was so poor. He only knew that this son had almost lost his life. Prior to this, he reckoned that this woman had hidden his son for selfish reasons and then covered up her action with an excuse. He even assumed that the twin would be as healthy as Sam. He only found out about Andres' poor health from the doctor after his visit during his son's hospital confinement. This news caught him by surprise, and he was filled with loving pity toward that son of his. Now, after knowing of how much that child had suffered since his birth, his heart was once again in pain to the point of suffocation. From her mere description, no one could tell how tormenting those days were. Clearly, she had poured so much effort and exhausted many days and nights to fight for Andres' life. She said resignedly, Maybe he's a late bloomer. The man only stared ponderously at her profile. She suddenly turned to ask him, Oh, yes, the day after tomorrow is their birthday. Have you prepared a present yet? Present? He raised an eyebrow questioningly, and then shook his head. No. No? She was startled. Why isn't there a present for your child on his birthday? He retorted. There is a present for him. Basically, he'll tell me what he likes, and I'll send someone to buy it for him. His doting love for Sam could not be doubted. Yet the expression of his fatherly love was lacking in sensitivity. She could not help reprimanding him. You should have prepared a present beforehand, and then the child can enjoy a birthday surprise that way. Surprise? Do children like surprises? He kept quiet. The man did not know how to create surprises. What the child liked, he got him. Pampering a child was just like pampering a woman. Isn't it sufficient to just get him what he likes? Monica, seemingly seeing through his thoughts, wistfully explained, What a child looks forward to the most on his birthday is opening his presents. That feeling of anticipation is priceless. I'm unsure of what to buy for him. 
Are you free in the afternoon? Yes. She paused and thought for a while before suggesting. Are you willing to go shopping with me? I'm shopping for Andres' birthday present. He nodded in agreement without hesitation. She could not help feeling a little elated. She knew very well how busy he often was. Since he controlled a conglomerate, it was a given that he would be occupied with work. Thus, she was rather surprised and happy to know that he was willing to go shopping with her at the mall. For some reason, her mood was elevated to the extent of the sky outside the window seemingly becoming extra brighter and more cheerful. The day would be a good day. After she had washed and walked out of the washroom, she saw that the man had already changed into a casual outfit and was lounging on the couch. Just as she came over to say something to him, she noticed his strange look. His body was slumped heavily on the couch, and his head was slightly drooping to the side as he struggled for his breath. His fingers were clenching the couch handles in a death grip, looking as if he were in pain. She was stunned by this. Leaning over slightly, she saw beads of cold perspiration dripping from his forehead. His handsome face was frighteningly wan. What? What's happening to you? Oh. Gastritis, he mumbled, trying to mask the agony with his husky voice. She suddenly recalled him looking the worse for wear earlier. When he hugged her from behind, she sensed him moving rigidly and leaning his heavy body on her more than usual, but she did not pay much attention to it then. She did not know that he was suffering from severe gastritis. The root of this illness was the death of his mother a decade ago. He locked himself in a room without food and drink. That was a dark period of his life. His mother meant everything to him in this life, and her death was too much for him to bear, so he neglected his body afterward. He even turned anorexic and lost massive weight within a month. Although he was finally cured of anorexia, his gastric problem would recur if he did not keep to his three meals on time. Whenever gastritis acted up, it would be excruciating for him despite his high threshold for pain. For that reason, he had gastric medication accessible at home. He lifted his heavy eyelids and pointed to the cabinet. <sighs> Medicine. Only then did she realize how serious his problem was. Andres, who also suffered from a slight case of gastritis, would exhibit such a pain-filled look, which really saddened her. Following where he had pointed to, she rifled through each drawer of the cabinet until she found the medication box. After setting aside the rest of the simple remedies, what was left inside the box was the gastric medication. She read the dosage instruction and prepared two tablets with a glass of water for him. He reached his hand for the glass, only for it to slip through his fingers when another excruciating colic racked his body. Pump! Glass fell and water splattered on the floor. Tiny shards of glass flew out her arms. His body stumbled to one side, and he fell heavily onto the couch. His well-chiseled features torted with great pain, as if he would pass out from it at any moment. Episode 188 Love Sickness she was oblivious to the oozing cuts on her arms as her focus was centered on his falling body, and she rushed to cup his face in her hand. Stop. Don't sit up. I'll feed you your medication. There was no response from him. The pain had robbed him of his consciousness. She hugged his shoulders and attempted to help him sit up. Unfortunately, his body was too heavy for her to lift. She looked frustratingly at the tablets in her hand, and then at the man's face, which was contorted with pain. Telling herself that there was no time to lose, she hurriedly got another glass of water and rested his head on a cushion on the sofa. As she held his nape to steady his face upward, she dissolved the tablets in the water before she took a mouthful and then carefully spritzed it into his mouth. His throat moved as he swallowed the water. 
she took another mouthful and transferred the rest of the medication into his mouth. After some time, the man regained his consciousness. His hazy eyes gradually opened to see her anxious face peering at him. He opened his mouth to speak, but no words would come forth. Are you able to sit up? It was nerve-wracking for her to observe his face drained of color. In her impression, this man was always acting high and mighty, like a powerful king or a heavenly god on any given day. Yet right now, he was only so frail under a gastritis attack. He had none of his usual vitality. She broke into a jest over her ignorance at this point. No matter how formidable this man might be, he was a human who needed to eat just like her. Man would fall sick sometimes, even someone with a strong constitution. After all, the man was not God. Did this happen because he had no breakfast when he woke up? For some reason, she blamed herself for that. Hence, she hastily said, You take a rest here. I'll make breakfast for you. She was about to stand up when the man tugged on her arm. She lost her balance and fell into his arms. What are you doing? She was rather antagonized as the thought of the possibility of her squashing him without fall. With his eyes revealing a hint of ominous teeth, his one palm cradled the back of her neck, while the other slowly caressed her lips. Where are you going? I'm going to make breakfast for you. Your irregular meals probably brought on this gastritis attack. She was for a moment. She moved to stand up once more, but he pulled her into his arms again. He firmly locked into his arms this time, so she had no opportunity to escape. What? What are you doing? She hissed indignantly. She frowned. Her petulant tone sounded slightly annoyed. Her eyes divulged her helplessness and exasperation, which the man took the chance to admire at close range. He bowed his head and observed her petulance fully. Startled at the man's deep study of her expression, she pouted and then uneasily bit her lower lip. Her little action was pettish and tempting for him. The way she bit her lip was so adorable, his stiff body, induced by the illness, started to heat up. Thus, he simply replied, I don't want breakfast. I want to eat you. When she heard that, her face went stiff. She then replied gloomily, Hey, I really lost to you. Your gastric pain flared up, yet you still dare to misbehave? I'm not only in gastric pain, I'm also in love sickness. Don't you know that? How long had it been since I last touched you? He could not remember the last time he did. He only knew that his body was constantly craving for her. He wanted to dominate her. He wanted to penetrate her. And he even wanted to melt her into his blood and bones. How long ago did he have a taste of that feeling? He missed it terribly. He missed it so much that despite suffering from gastric pain, his innate desire lay in wait all this time. Just like a boy in his adolescence, after taking the first bite of the forbidden fruit, he wanted another bite. Monica was vexed. Stephen, are you this shameless? Your body is already like this, yet... Halfway through, she stopped speaking. She could not continue at all, as she felt absolute embarrassment. As a shy blush appeared on her fair face, she lowered her gaze. If she could, she would dig a hole on the floor and bury her burning face into it right this instant. When he saw the shyness on her face... He found the sight to be rather interesting and a little amusing. He prided himself as a man who did not succumb to his libido. Unlike those playboys, he could keep himself from women to the extent of developing a fetish for cleanliness. Alas, this woman just had to be a harbinger of calamity for being a natural femme fatale. She had the innate ability to ensnare any man from all walks of life. He looped his arm around her neck at once and pulled her face closer to his. 
The smoldering eyes slowly observed her features for a while, before he let his face sink into her hair, sniffing the fresh and enchanting fragrance between the strands without care. At the same time, because of his depression, his body became so tight it was a little sore. The man slowly opened his fierce eyes, and meeting with her breathtaking appearance once more, he suddenly asked, You think going to bed with me is something embarrassing? Her face was slightly heated, but she did not utter a word. She appeared to be declining to comment. The man grinned and whispered to her, Woman, you know, scientists say that based on an adult's normal schedule for sex, it should happen at least thrice or four times a week. Huh? At his impromptu speech, she had no time to react at all. Soon after, it triggered the man to push forward with the interrogation. Think about it. How long has it been since I've touched you? Should I repress an ordinary request, too? Somehow, she was at a loss for words. Spoke with much aplomb she was unable to counter. Still, she kept feeling that his logic was somewhat flawed. He held a strand of her beautiful hair, twisting and fondling it between his fingers, and spoke disarmingly. I only have one woman. You. If I have needs and you forbid me to touch you, who do I touch then? Moreover, you're a woman and I'm a man. Do these intimacies appear to be embarrassing to you? She gave it a thought, and suddenly, flushed with rage. You... You clearly have a fiancé! For some reason, something appeared on the man's handsome, yet sunken face. His phoenix eyes slightly squinted with a somewhat profound look. This was what she was concerned about? Should he say... That she was just feeling jealous? Episode 189 Being Jealous Was she really jealous of a fiancé existing only in name? Monica was made uncomfortable by his stare, so she simply tried to pass it off. Forget it. Is your tummy still in pain? He completely ignored her question, though. Are you, perhaps, jealous? No! You clearly are. If you're feeling jealous, then let me tell you. You have nothing to worry about in that aspect. Stefan circled his hands around her waist and forced her closer to him. He slightly turned her body over and pinned her under him. Pinching her chin, he placed his thin lips gently over hers. His gentle kiss sealed her lip. Eventually, breaking apart that simple yet sweet kiss, he gazed at her and slightly beamed. You only need to know that I just want you. I have no feelings for other women. As he said that, he held the hands of clueless Monica as he led her over. Her face instantly heated up. What about you? Don't you want me? He whispered this to her ears fanning her earlobe with his warm breath, her ears all the way to her nape were tainted red. This woman's physical constitution was prone to blushing. She was just like a mimosa. A light touch could cause a shy blush to spread across her skin. You! Monica was boiling with rage. Enough! He gave her no chances to refute by jamming up her lips with his words. I only want you. I don't have feelings for other women. His words provoked her already blushing skin to turn a deeper shade of scarlet. He kissed her softly, and then enunciated, I will bestow you with a proper title. Just not now. She could not help but laugh dryly at his declaration before she blurted out, Stephen, can I take this as your proposal? The man's face stiffened immediately. You have gastric pain, though. If you don't know how to restrain yourself, in time to come, you'll be the one to suffer. She lectured him in all seriousness. Her words were seemingly a prediction or a curse, for as soon as she said that, his tummy's condition 
which had slightly improved, wrenched chaotically in you. This woman, was she a person who cursed others? Did she be secretly cursing him to suffer from gastric pain? It was this effective as well. Speak of the devil, and it would appear. Why would this chain such a killjoy? A certain man would surely nurse a grievance. In order to devour this woman, since she did not like his aggressive methods, he tried to convince her with reason and move her with emotions. He was almost successful with his attempts, but the pain came back with a vengeance. Damn. If your tummy's in pain, then you should rest. She pushed him further onto the sofa. As she was leaving, she imparted with him a few words. Wait for me obediently. I'll go cook some noodles for you. He watched her leave in consternation. All his hopes were dashed into pieces. Staring at the morsel which had almost entered his mouth fly away, his mind completely went blank. She shut the door and held her chest with her hands. Her heart was thumping wildly. I will bestow you with a proper title. The man's declaration reverberated in her ears. She dared not let his words get to her. Taking a deep breath, she proceeded to prepare some noodles for the man. After a while, a heady bowl of nutritious egg noodles was made. The ingredients she found in the kitchen were impressive, but once she thought of his gastric pain, she decided to cook him a bowl of noodles instead. He would not have much of an appetite anyway. Her cooking skills were not impressive. However, it was not too difficult for her to prepare a basic noodle dish. Although her culinary abilities were incomparable to Andres's, her standards were at least pleasing to the eye. She specifically made the noodles extremely mushy. Strands would break once they entered his mouth and were easily digestible. When she brought the bowl of noodles to him, Stefan put on a frustrated and cold look. Looking at the way he eyed the bowl of noodles, a distinct impression could be made. He was frustrated. He was really frustrated. How frustrated was he exactly? I don't want to eat the noodles. I want to eat. Shut up and eat the noodles! Monica cut him off with a reddened face. Is it wrong that I want to eat meat too? He held up the bowl of noodles and spouted these words on purpose. He looked innocent, but from his eyes, there was a slight desire to tease her. Pushing the envelope was already considered as teasing her. He could not touch her physically, so as teasing her with words not allowed to. As he willfully admired her face, flame with embarrassment, he felt a tad better emotionally. Soon, he wiped clean the bowl of noodles. Once all the noodles in the bowl were gone, his gastric pain seemed to have disappeared as well. The vehicle slowly drove into the shopping center. Stefan dropped her at the entrance before leaving Oz to park the vehicle by himself. Monica lifted her gaze to examine the shopping center's glamorous main entrance. Such a massive infrastructure was situated in the most expensive piece of land within the city center. It was a sweet spot worth nearly silver and gold per inch of land. The entrance was luxurious and splendid. Even those security guards standing by the revolving glass doors appeared to have the poor and dogs are not allowed entrance written all over their faces. She said she wanted to get presents, so he drove her here. Rumors had it that consumption was high here. People without a monthly net salary of at least $100,000 did not dare enter this place. She did not give it further thought and went in. The stores on the first floor mostly sold cosmetics and expensive brands of jewelry. The man told her to wait for him on the first floor, so she was in no hurry to reach the second floor, and decided to check the jewelry shops near the mall entrance. She was not going to buy anything and was just looking around. While she was window shopping, she heard an unfamiliar yet intimate voice call, Monica? Somewhat startled, she looked around and spotted her ex-colleague, Marita Moore, walking toward her. Marita was said to be a stack of flowers in the office. Not only did she have a curvaceous body, she even had enviable facial features. 
before Monica came, she had it good in the office. After all, in that company, most employees were male, and single females were in the minority. Thus, among the single ladies, her pleasant appearance naturally stood out, and she became hot property and an influential figure. However, after Monica came, things were different. Her gentle and easygoing personality, coupled with her friendliness and helpfulness to other female colleagues, which was in stark contrast with Marita, easily won her the limelight. Marita was green with envy and hostile toward Monica. In fact, she would push her aside often. With her gone, Marita recovered the throne, and she now had many people in the company wrapped around her finger. Recently, she had a private affair with her superior. Hooking up with such a person, she was naturally promoted to the assistant manager of the company's human resources department. It was her heyday. Therefore, Ferent was much more audacious than her past self. She was more generous with her spending and frequented high-end for shopping. It was quite unexpected for her to bump into Monica here. Her impression of the latter was that of a prude. She was much unconcerned with branded goods. If it were not for her attractive looks, she would truly depreciate in value wearing those cheap clothes every day. What made her even more jealous of Monica was that the latter's ability to bring out a chic taste in those shabby clothes. She really had no idea how she did that. Is it true that as long as one is pretty, a person can look good in anything? Monica! I haven't seen you in a while. What a coincidence seeing you here. Marita swayed her hips as she approached her. I haven't heard any news from you recently. Did you find yourself another job after leaving the company? Her every action was seductive and enticing. Monica had a poor impression of this woman. Not only did she ostracize her, she even behaved no differently from the green tea bitch in the company. Thus, her return greeting was rather lukewarm. I did find a job. Marita was unperturbed by her tepid attitude and even inched closer to her. Monica might be regarded as goddess in the company before, but the present was different. By snagging herself a top brass, her status and position were elevated as well, so she, of course, wanted to use this rare opportunity to show off. Why are you so cool toward me? Did you have a bad day? How about we go for coffee at Hollywood Cafe? My treat. Hollywood Cafe was an expensive place for consumption. It's not necessary. I am waiting for someone. She blandly rejected her offer, and then started to check the displayed items on the counter. Marita saw her looking at the jewelry and stuck her grinning face close like a piece of plaster. Tiffany and Company. This is a premier luxury brand. Jewelry isn't cheap here. I just bought an item from here yesterday. That piece is expensive, but totally worth the price, as it looks good on me. She ignored the woman's chatter and continued to browse. Why did this woman have so much to say? Monica was starting to get on her nerves. If it were not because she was waiting for Stefan, she would try to shake her off by hurrying upstairs. The sales staff at Tiffany's counter could not help but look at Monica when she saw her quietly browse through the shop's items. To her, the customer looked poor in her non-designer clothes. From here, she could deduce that the latter had no purchasing power. In contrast, the fashionable woman standing beside her, who was carrying expensive labels on her entire body, appeared to be rich. She took a closer look at the necklace, which Marita seemed to be intentionally fidgeting with on her neck, and said with a start, Wow, pretty lady, are you perhaps wearing a necklace from the Volgari series? The woman smiled knowingly. I got this a while ago. I don't really like it. It's pretty cheap and only cost me a little over $20,000. Oh, it looks good on you. Still, I have something here that suits you more. She made a deliberate show of daintiness before saying, Well, let me have a look. The two of them cozily bantered in this manner. By the counter, 
Monica was stumped by the long series of zeros indicated on each item's price tag. A pretentious chatting between Marita and the salesgirl also turned her off as she knew that they were doing this to put her down. It was such a spoiled sport that she was tempted to leave. Stefan parked his car and stepped into the mall to find her. He finally saw her aimlessly standing at a jewelry counter and casually walked over to her. Have you waited long? His appearance got the attention of Morita. Episode 190 Kiss the Beauty His appearance got the attention of Morita. Who is that man? He looks wealthy and important. Why is he with Monica? Morita could single out the expensive brands on him. It was incompatible to have him match with the shabby Monica. Monica? Who is he? Monica's lips twitched at the corner. She wanted to ignore her, but after glancing coolly at Morita, the man bowed his head to ask, Do you know each other? She's my ex-colleague. We're friends. Both replied at the same time, but with different answers. Marita raised an awkward smile and asked, Monica, come and do an introduction. I'm her man. Before she could open her mouth, Stefan simply mouthed these three words. Two women were stunned. What did you say? It is so. Marita clenched her crimson lips in frustration. She felt that she had lost to her in this regard. Somehow, this man seemed too good to be true. How could he be her competitor's man when the latter had nothing to boast about? The elites were particular about the background and status of their partners. For a common folk like Monica, how did she end up with an aristocrat? The longer she pondered, the further she fumed. She was out to show off in front of her, but it seemed her hand got bitten instead. She was extremely unhappy about this, of course. The man gently cuddled Monica's head with his palm and asked, Have you been taking a fancy to anything here? I'll get it for you. No, she answered quietly, yet her eyes surreptitiously strayed on a pair of dainty earrings in the display cabinet. The pair was in the shape of a five-petal flower and looked like a starry embellishment from afar. He followed her gaze to that pair of earrings. A slender finger pointed at the cabinet. Show me this pair. She opened her mouth in surprise and did not understand the meaning of his action. The salesgirl could not help feeling incredulous as she glanced at Monica. She would have disregarded the request if it had come from this shabby woman. Their shop's jewelry were expensive, and the sales staff was unwilling to show them to ordinary folks. Who would pay if they were broken accidentally? This was especially the case for those who dressed shabbily like Monica and looked as if they could not afford to compensate for the loss. It was different for him, though. She could tell at a glance that he was from a wealthy background. He saw the look in the salesgirl's eyes and knew what was on her mind, but he did not make a comment regarding them. When the salesgirl presented the pair of earrings to him, he reached out for one of the studs and gently brushed away the hair on Monica's shoulder to expose her little, lovely earlobe. He gently put the earring on her, which looked like a sparkling star as it danced on her fair earlobe. This dazzling sight seemed to be calling out to him. Thus, he took action by leaning over and planting a kiss on her earlobe with his breezy thin lips. Marita stood there, dumbstruck, at this beautiful display of affection. Monica's heart skipped a beat from obvious embarrassment. Her body retracted slightly as she glared at him in annoyance. <gasps> you! Take a look. Do you like it? He pushed her in front of the mirror and lifted her hair to reveal the earring on her lobe. She said nothing, yet her eyes fully showed her delight. He went on to put the other stud on her. The sales girl immediately praised, This lady looks really good in these earrings. Sir, do you want the pair? Yes. He answered the sales girl without removing his side from Monica even once. 
He then casually passed over his black gold card for the bill. The sales girl was still wondering why the man had not asked for the price of the earrings when she took a look at the credit card he had handed to her. There was no more doubts thereafter. Silver card, the king of all cards, signified the unreachable status of its card holder. Across the capital, only five people owned this type of card. Even Marita was too stunned for words. She was really taken aback this time. Who was this man exactly? An average wealthy man could not afford such a card. Swiping the card for the bill, the sales girl passed the gift box to Stefan and watched the man leave with Monica in his arms. Monica! Marita tried to chase the leading pair, but they totally ignored her. She looked utterly embarrassed and returned to the counter to ask the girl, Is that man holding the legendary silver card? The sales girl's mouth twitched a little before replying, Sorry, madam, I am not allowed to divulge the personal information of my customer. How much does that pair of earrings which the man has just bought cost? I want it too. Eager to salvage her reputation, she pompously declared that that's the only pair we have at this shop. Still, I can tell you the price. It costs a thousand dollars. Thousand dollars? Thousand dollars for a pair of earrings? Her face froze. The toy section was on the fifth floor, but he took her to the women's section on the third floor first. Without any delay, he picked a few designer clothes off the rack at the Chanel store. As he sat elegantly on the sofa, he ordered, Go and change, she asked. What are you trying to do? I'm going to buy you some clothes. She frowned unceremoniously. I don't want... He would not tolerate her objection. Signaling with his fingers, he got a few sales staff to bring her to the changing room. He grinned devilishly. She was trying to act stubborn with him. She had to know she was on his turf in this mall. Her protest could be heard from the changing room. All of you, get out! Hey, don't take off my clothes! I'll do it! Can I change my clothes by myself? Get out! The sales girl were eventually chased out from the room. She stepped out in a pink dress not long after. The design made her look young. Episode 191, Intruders. Stefan took one look at her and was greatly pleased with what he saw. Returning his face to the magazines he was reading, he ordered, Go and change into another set. She went in and out a few times to change a tire until it hit him. Damn, this woman looked good in anything. Realizing this, he furrowed his brows. In the end, he stood up and walked to the counter. I'll take this, 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 and that. And, uh, what else? Um, that design as well. Pack all these up. Yes, sir. Monica sighed. Why does this man shop for clothes as if he's at a wholesale market? By the time she reached the toys department on the fifth floor, few shopping bags were weighing heavily on her arm. Inside the toy store, she purposely selected a well-known toy brand and gift-wrapped it beautifully thereafter. When she came out, she passed this over to him. This is a gift for the child. It was her specially selected gift for Sam. He took the present along with a greeting card she had personally written. Her handwriting was pretty and neat. At the end of the handwriting trail was a heartwarming, smiley emoticon. I suppose this is what it means by a birthday surprise. After shopping, it was naturally time to eat. She picked a restaurant, but it turned out to be packed with many patrons. One of the service crew apologetically told her that the only seats available were in the main dining hall. The man made a call, and soon after, the restaurant manager rushed over. This person in charge personally led a team to give them a warm greeting when he learned that the chairman of Makewell Financial Group was in the restaurant. The manager was stunned at the sight of the sweet and young girl beside the director. With a smile, he looked at her and asked politely, How may I address you, miss? 
She returned a slight smile to the manager, just as Stefan's arms pulled her closer to him, making a silent declaration of her status. Since she was Mr. Lewis's woman, the manager needed to serve her well, right? No one could afford to incur a woman's wrath especially the woman of this important person. Stefan could guess what was on the manager's mind with one look, but he was too lazy to say anything more and only commanded coolly, Prepare a table for me. The manager hastily nodded. Yes, I'll have a table prepared for you this instant. He specifically set aside an elegantly decorated private dining room. The dim lights and glass windows with bead curtains caused it to exude a classical charm. The manager dared not tarry for someone this important. Besides, it was a great honor for Mr. Lewis to visit this restaurant. Actually, another customer had already paid and reserved the private dining room on this very day and at an earlier time. Giving this room to Stefan would mean clashing with that other patron. But what else could he do? The manager put emphasis on this VIP's dislike for noise and his need to be served in a private room. No patron was more important than this man, so the manager could only cancel the reservation even if it meant offending the other person. Monica was so famished, she was already lightheaded. Her growling tummy made her grumpy, and she became even more grouchy when the man walked far before her without considering the load she was carrying. However, her grouchiness instantly dispersed when she laid eyes on the cuisines on the table as she took a seat. Just the two of them were occupying this big round table filled with food which tantalized all senses. It was extravagant and decadent, but at this moment, she was very willing to be decadent. Oh, God, this is absolute bliss. Still, how can you finish all this food? Isn't it a waste if we can't finish this? Hence, she decided that, unlike the last time, she would have the leftover food as takeaways. Enticed by the delectable spread before her, she was all ready to dig in with her chopsticks. But when she glanced over at the man sitting beside her, she saw his glaring disinterest with the food. Right now, the man was wiping his hands without even looking once at all the cuisines on the table. His mister was fuss pot when it came to his food. He was used to a good and pampered life since young, so these dishes were unsurprisingly not to his taste. He only came to eat at this restaurant because of her. In fact, for him, this wonderful spread was not even comparable to her homemade noodles. She watched his graceful mannerism at the table and attributed it to his aristocratic upbringing. She just realized at this moment that he had a serious case of obsessive compulsion regarding Bert. She secretly despised such prettiness and decided to ignore him. Proceeding to pick up a chunk of beef and put it into her mouth, happiness burst within her, and she carefully munched on the meat. It was so delicious, she almost cried tears of joy. Besides Andre's cooking, she had never tasted such nice food before. Just then, she heard approaching footsteps outside the door and looked over quizzically. A woman's disgruntled and petulant voice was heard vaguely. I've already booked this dining room. How could you cancel my reservation just like that? Please, don't be upset, Miss Forbes. We have a very important customer we can't afford to say no. I definitely wouldn't dare cancel your reservation if it weren't for that. Oh, am I not an important customer too? How can you be a boss when you don't understand the rule on first come, first serve? You're a businessman yet. No wonder it is said that all businessmen are despicable. Sorry. I'm very sorry. This won't happen again. The owner apologized profusely, trying to pacify her. Next time? How can there be a next time? Get lost! Don't. Please wait, Miss Forbes. There's someone inside the room. Don't block my way. I want to see just who this VIP that snatched my reservation is. What a daredevil! The door to the private dining room was pushed open suddenly. This action was so noisy and rude, it caused the man to look over as well. He frowned frostily. A well-dressed woman with dainty makeup 
in a black maxi dress, was standing outside the room. There was another man standing beside her. He looked aristocratic and outstanding. The two's elegant mannerisms alluded to their elite background. The restaurant owner, perspiring with great anxiety, quickly stood to one side as he looked at Stefan, frightful smile. He would intermittently size up the woman standing beside him, not knowing how to ease the situation. The woman's eyes narrowed sharply as she caught a glimpse of Monica. She was about to open her mouth sullenly when her peripheral view also registered the regal man sitting beside her. She immediately swallowed back her words. Lewis? Mr. Stephen Lewis? Her red lips opened and closed in astonishment as her eyes revealed an elation. Stephen maintained an icy expression as he regarded her. At one glance, she knew that he had forgotten her. The situation had turned rather awkward and tense. Episode 192 A Man's Desire to Dominate The situation had turned rather awkward and tense. Time to think about it. Indeed, how would the almighty crown prince of Makewell's financial group remember a mere daughter of a provincial governor? This woman, Katrina Forbes, was the beloved daughter of the governor of the Los Angeles province. Originally, she had reserved this room and this restaurant for an exorbitant price. She planned to entertain her good friend, who had returned recently overseas, here, but her reservation was unexpectedly and impolitely cancelled by the restaurant owner just before she arrived. Thus, she came storming into the room in a fit of rage, only to discover that the person who had snatched away her reservation was the chairman of Midwealth, Stephen Lewis. After all, he seldom came to small restaurants like this for a meal. Moreover, from what she could remember, this man was busy dealing with important matters every day, so how was it possible for him to have the leisure to eat here? Katrina was pleasantly surprised to meet Stefan. However, after feeling surprised, her eyes landed on Monica again, and she became a little confused. How was this gal sitting beside him? Looking at her, she was dressed like an ignorant student. Katrina was a little taken aback. For someone of Stefan's status, as long as he desired it, many bells, international supermodels, famous film actresses, or even rich female socialites would eagerly appear before him with a crook of his finger. However, this young-looking gal was probably only a fresh graduate. Having prided herself for being discerning, she must admit that this teenage girl was absolute eye candy. Many men would jump the bones of such beauty if she were to enter the industry she was in. Monica got uncomfortable by her scrutinizing stare. Turning her head away from the woman in discomfort, she felt another pair of heated eyes on her and instinctively faced the direction of the stare, only to discover that the man beside Katrina was sizing her up unwaveringly. Rather than saying that he was sizing her up, it was more accurate to say that the man's eyes held a hint of desire to devour her alive. The man had a towering physique and a handsome appearance. Although he dressed for comfort, he still had a noble bearing from this. It could be inferred that came from a wealthy family. When their eyes happened to meet, she subconsciously averted her gaze away. Suddenly,
Suddenly, she harbored ill feelings against these two who had so rudely barged into the room. Realizing the awkwardness of the situation, Katrina forced out a bright smile and asked in a saccharine voice, Mr. Lewis, do you remember me? My father is Mason Forbes. He should be acquainted with you. Oh, yes, if you don't mind, let's share the table. You see, at this time, there aren't any empty rooms left in the restaurant. <laughs> this room, which I've reserved earlier, is also, she said in a very roundabout manner. Her words of the proposal also held propriety and courtesy. Stefan did not bat an eyelid. He neither accepted nor rejected her proposal. In fact, he seemed to have given her his silent consent. Seeing this, Katrina was quite overwhelmed with the unexpected favor. She took a step forward to sound him out. When she noticed that he remained composed, her heart, which was previously held in suspension, reverted to being calm. Her eyes then brightened, and together with the man next to her, she walked into the room. Stefan obviously had no impression of Katrina. They did not know each other very well, and did not meet often enough. As for her father, Mason was someone he had close associations with. Taking this into consideration, he was unable to not give her face. Monica, however, was not very keen on sharing the table for a meal. She did not like the two intruders. This was especially the case for the woman. The look she was giving her seemed to wish for her destruction. She had to admit that this situation did not sit very well with her. But what was making her more upset was his tacit consent for the pair to share the table with them. She was annoyed. What did she do, though? She could not chase them out. She did not have the right to do so. She was only there to get free food and drinks. She picked up her chopsticks, yet her appetite was already lost. Katrina settled down with a jovial smile on her face. She started off the introduction in earnest. Mr. Lewis, let me introduce you. This is the eldest young member of the Mills group, Carl Mills. Katrina pleasantly faced the man beside her. Carl, I've told you about him before. He's the famous CEO of Makewell Financial Group, a legendary figure in the capital, Stephen Lewis. As she spoke, she completely left out Monica, who was sitting at the side. Monica was relieved to have her ears cleansed. Mr. Lewis. I've heard so much about you. With a grin, Carl slightly lifted himself off his seat and preferred his hand to the man politely. Stefan glanced solemnly at his outstretched hand. There was no change in his expression. Carl's hand then simply froze in midair, unsure if he should keep it extended or retract it. Just when the atmosphere was about to solidify, Stefan stretched his arm indifferently and lightly held the other man's hand without even bending his fingers. His cold and distant attitude made Carl feel extremely awkward. This man was haughty like a ruler. He thought, even if his status was not as noble as Stefan's, not many across the entire capital would dare give him an apathetic expression. Many would smile along with him out of respect. This man just had to be indifferent and arrogant at their first meeting. He was truly embarrassed. Katrina laughed to ease the tension in the air. She looked at Monica at the side. Oh, Mr. Lewis, this lady is... You don't have to know. She did not expect that a few nonchalant words from him had resisted her passion. He never liked telling insignificant people about his private affairs. However... In Katrina's eyes, his ambiguous answer was interpreted as another form of protection. She felt displeased all of a sudden, as her good intention was snubbed, but she could only laugh along due to Stefan's status, and try to find a way out, albeit resentfully. This little girl looks quite bright and beautiful. She appeared to be all smiles, yet she felt nothing but envy and hatred, for she could tell that this girl meant a lot to Stefan. At her mention of Monica, the dissatisfaction in Carl's heart dissipated, and he gazed at her with some sort of affection. Honestly speaking, 
It was quite interested in this girl. She had an astonishingly lucid and unyieldingly elegant look, which seemed to be deeply ingrained in her. These virtually triggered a man's desire to dominate her. It was said that there were two types of women men could not resist. One was a woman clear like water and free of any impurities. Another was a woman who could bring out men's desire to dominate her. Coincidentally, she fell under both categories. Come to think of it, it appeared Stefan had some sort of capabilities. The rumors circulating had it that he shielded himself away from women. No one knew that he was actually hiding such a lovely creature. Others would surely be jealous of him. At this moment, the two harbored different thoughts on Monica. Carl wanted a sort of taste of this girl, but upon noticing that such a lovely character was already under ownership, he could only admire her from a distance. What kind of woman had he not seen before? Still, none was as pleasing as this girl. Since she was Stefan's woman, he could not lay his hands on her. Could not be helped. He could only anxiously hope for the man to grow tired of her some day. He would then snatch her away from him. Carl grinned at her. With a graceful bearing, he gently inquired, Whose family does this cute little lady belong to? Episode 193 Monica's Embarrassment Carl grinned at her. With a graceful bearing, he gently inquired, Whose family does this cute little lady belong to? Monica was stunned. She wanted to ignore him. She wasn't the elite, for she was not born as a noble. She remained apathetic, as she did not want to encourage his attention. Yet he interpreted this as her being shy, and softened his voice even more. May I ask, how do I address you? Trina was completely disregarded. She appeared to be expressionless. She was secretly cursing him. How immoral. He is a man, indeed. Losing his mind just from seeing this lovely prey. He dared covet Stefan's woman. Where did he get the guts to do so? Monica took a sideward glance at the grave-looking Stefan beside her. Suddenly, she smiled cheekily, and her eyes and brows formed curves. Her lips, which were stained with red wine, appeared to be supple and moist. So, when she beamed, they looked rather seductive and enchanting. In fact, they were alluringly inviting. Why should I tell you? She shrugged him off then. Interesting. This girl is very interesting. She's quite haughty. Carl kept thinking about Monica as Katrina rolled her eyes furtively. She mouthed a warning to him not to go too far with expressing his interest in Monica and to refrain from making Stefan angry. How was he be afraid of him? Carl, who was spoiled and cherished growing up, was the typical playboy. He was used to treating others with contempt, so why would he put up with Stefan Lewis? The Lewis family... It was nothing more than a distinguished line of the nobility of the previous generation. With the changing of times and the old Lewis getting on in years, could this bastard still rely on Lewis's power and position? The Mills family was also one of the most powerful and honorable families within the capital. Each member of the family was a real piece of work. How would Monica know what he was planning at all, though? Sensing that prickling and malicious stare from Katrina, Monica met with her doubtful and hostile eyes. She was unjustly attacked, but she could not go down without a fight, said she. If everything had come to this, then she might as well continue to act it out until the end. Thus, under her straight stare, she delicately encircled Stefan in her arms. With a sickeningly sweet voice, she requested him while smiling. Help me peel a lobster. Stefan had played many schemes on the market before, so how was he not capable of understanding her intentions? He shot her a cold glance from his peripheral, seemingly warning her to quit playing tricks. 
he had never waited on anyone, even now. She was a little downcast due to her fail attempt. Why would this man not coordinate with her at all? Katrina seemed satisfied. She reckoned that this girl had overstepped her boundaries. She became insatiable with her position as Stefan's woman. When had Stefan ever waited on anyone in the past? Putting down her chopsticks, Monica completely lost her appetite and gulped down an entire glass of iced water at hand. However, after drinking it, she felt an unexplainable yet painful swelling from her tummy. She tried to ignore it and keep her spirits up. Soon after, she clearly felt something strange in her lower abdomen, and at the sudden gush of tepid moisture from down there, her expression completely crumbled as she froze in place. Oh no! No way! Would that have come? As she withheld her suspicions, she was greatly perturbed and was on the tenor hook. Her entire body went stiff, and she was rendered immobile. Alas, that sensation only increased in prominence. Her face was suddenly hot and dry. She moved to get up, wanting to go check in the washroom exactly what had happened, but halfway from doing so, her eyes discovered a fresh red spot on the stool. Her face instantly burned, and she promptly sat back down. Oh, God! How embarrassing! She wanted to cry, but no tears would come out. Why was she being such an embarrassment? And this had to happen right in the company of this man and some outsiders. She simply wanted to dig a hole to bury herself into. Stefan noticed her abnormality and lowered his head to ask, What's wrong? How could Monica tell him something so embarrassing? She was even puzzled about what she should do with the current situation. Stefan was surprised to see her narrowing her eyes and flushing red and hot. Stefan? She hugged his elbow closely, and with her torso leaning on him, whispered pleadingly, Can you ask them to leave? Katrina was startled to hear her directly address the man by his name. This woman was the first and the only one to do that. Stefan was not angry with that, however. The two heard the latter part of her plea, and were shocked by the lass's unexpected rudeness. Even more surprising was the way Stefan looked at them after she had uttered that request. Although the man did not say a word, his frosty expression sufficed as a command for them to leave. Katrina, who was totally embarrassed, refused to accept such humiliation. She somehow had to dig her way out of this thorny situation, so she said, Mr. Lewis, I just remembered that Carl and me have something urgent to attend. We shan't bother you further. With that, she glared fiercely at Monica and tugged at the gawking Carl. Let's go. He returned his attention to her and left with her thereafter. The man held a snubbed look just as the two exited the room. When had he ever been so disgraced? Despite that, he could not forget Monica. Are you still hankering for that woman? I must say, you are audacious to covet Mr. Lewis as a woman. He'll be in deep shit if he finds out about this. Why are you such a boot licker? This is what I can't tolerate. Is the Lewis family really that great? He was vexed with her sarcasm. What is this Mr. Lewis this, Mr. Lewis that? Why are you harping about him? Are you interested in him? Katrina. Oh. I must say that, even though you may like him, that doesn't mean he wants you to. It's none of your business! With her face fuming red, she angrily pounded her foot before striding off. Carl turned to take a look at the dining room. He flashed an eerie smile as his heart ambitiously pined for Monica. The dining room regained its former peace. Monica held her tummy as she leaned on the table. Her face was pale and contorted in agony, as her belly churned and twisted. Whenever she had her menstruation, she would flip in pain all night, tossing and turning in bed. Nursing with a hot pack did not seem to work either. Damn! Tragedy! Period was as painful as before, except it came without warning. The worst happened in front of this man. On top of that, she was wearing a dress, and the stain had seeped through from it, 
and onto the seat. She was too embarrassed to shift her butt from the chair. Such a disgrace. Her face turned a deep shade of scarlet as she thought of this. Crying would not help. The man raised a brow when he saw her looking sheet white and perspiring profusely. Are you sick? She felt so scared and ashamed at his question. Stammering, she asked him to leave. Oh, Stefan, can, can, can you also leave the room for a while? Leave the room? What's this woman up to again? What is wrong exactly? She smiled wryly. Oh, no, I'm fine. She was too embarrassed, and in any case, he would most likely not understand it. Episode 194, Blood. Stefan regarded her grimly for a while, but eventually he lost his patience with her. Thinking that she was just being difficult by refusing to tell him her discomfort, he threaded one arm under her waist and the other at the back of her knees, for he unhesitatingly pulled her into his chest. However, this caused her to yell in return. Her scream was so piercing, it almost shattered his eardrums. Shrub! His brows creased in frustration. Seeing him shoot her a sharp glare, she choked from shock and abruptly fell silent. After a moment's silence, suddenly, Stefan, her voice was taut and he soft, like a sheep's wool. What? He tilted his gaze down, only to spot an abnormal flush on her face. He swiftly caught on that something was wrong. Catching sight of a glaringly bloody blot on the stool from a peripheral, his heart momentarily skipped deep. He laid his eyes on her straight away. Blood? She was injured? What's going on? Meanwhile, Monica's face was already swollen red from embarrassment. Frightened that she would dirty his body with her fell, she practically broke into tears as she half panically said, Stefan, let me down. He dismissed her plea and with dark eyes, inquired, Where did you hurt yourself? She rolled her eyes listlessly, and with cheeks unbelievably aflame red, replied in a voice as weak as a buzzing fly, No, not hurt anywhere. You're not saying it? His eyes were cold and sharp. He spoke in a voice that brooked no argument. Send you to the hospital. Yeah. The hospital? It was not severe to that extent. She hurriedly clutched onto his clothes and spoke haltingly. My... my... that... thing. He did not hear her clearly as she spoke too softly. Realizing that the man was still moving toward the exit with her in his arms, she nearly collapsed from rage. She was so pressed that she wanted to scratch him. What could she do? Bolstering her courage, she slightly raised her voice. Stefan... I'm on my menstruation. The man halted his steps immediately. She stammered slyly. There's no need to go to the hospital. Just help me buy some sanitary napkins. A dead silence followed right after. She noticed that his face had completely darkened. Was there anything more stirring and solemn than this? She originally thought that the somber mood would prevail and never expected him to wrap her up securely with the suit jacket he had picked up from the chair before carrying her out of the place, bridal style. She was somewhat flustered. She did not know where he was leading her to while hugging her. Could he be sending her to the hospital? Stefan, where are we going? Back to the hotel. I have a change of clothes. His words were precise and to the point. They might be said emotionlessly, but they made her feel at ease. She heaved a sigh of relief and calmed herself down. The stares she received on their way out made her feel a little abashed, so she buried her face deep and nuzzled into his chest. It was hot, firm, and muscular. Through the clothing, she could feel the powerful thumping of his heart. Dong, dong. She vividly felt his heartbeats. This moment of affectionate intimacy temporarily masked her breathing. Nonetheless, her heart felt nice and warm. She stole a peek at him and examined his extremely handsome side profile. 
He had a high nose bridge, chillingly thin lips, and a haughty chin. His sexy and distinct collarbones were exposed from his slightly opened blouse collar. He looked like an ancient Greek god that had walked out from a wall mural. Each stroke was akin to a skillful illustration. He was extremely dashing. She must admit that, despite his despicable actions, she might harbor some feelings for him. Stefan frowned when he felt her close inspection of him and lowered his eyes chillingly to her. What? Stunned, Monica hastily steadied her nerves and averted her gaze away from him. She actually felt a bit satisfied. Although he maintained an aloof look, from what she could remember, no one other than him had treated her this nicely and showed concern for her before. When they arrived at the hotel suite, he put her down and she scampered into the washroom like a fleeing rabbit. The man eyed the door shutting tightly and was about to leave when a second later, a certain shy and sulky woman pried a crack open. She leaned on the door and pleaded with weakened breathing. Stefan, help me buy sanitary napkins. He spoke in a grave tone. I'll have someone buy it for you. She exclaimed. No, Stefan, don't let others buy it for me, okay? It was too embarrassing. His expressionless face stiffened and turned gloomy. What difference does it make? She was stumped. There was not much of a difference, indeed. It was just that the thought of his chauffeur's and assistants being burly fellows made her feel awkward. She was too embarrassed to ask them for a favor, so she pouted and acted willfully. I don't care. I'm not going to use any if you're not the one buying it. Don't be willful, woman. She acted coy and painted a pitiful look. Oh, Stefan. The man's expression turned cold as he ignored her again. He said nothing more and left without hesitation. Her brows furrowed in anger. This man was too ruthless. Was he going to turn a blind eye on her and leave her hanging just like this? Five minutes later, when the capital's haughty prince, the well-known impeccable figure in the financial sector, stood at the feminine care column, and when the man's slender fingers held up a cute and delicate pack of sanitary pads, everyone in the mart was so flabbergasted they threw him sidelong glances in succession. They gave him all sorts of looks, judging him and sizing him up. Stefan squeezed that thing tightly as the blood in his chest churned. He swept a cold gaze across. A freezing look in his eyes caused the air in the entire area to plunge at once. To sub-zero temperature. What were they thinking? Anyway, this was something more life-threatening than getting shot by a gun. He was clueless about this. Hence, he bought a little of everything of different sizes and uses. As he was making his payment, the cashier stared in shock at the assortment of sanitary pads in front of her. Um, he was not a pervert, right? She looked at the immaculately dressed and handsome man in front of her. She could not imagine him being one at all. He stuffed his hands into his pockets and felt an unusual stare from the cashier inspecting him. He glanced over at her coldly, causing the latter to meekly lower her head to scan the item. She dared not to take another look at him and forced herself to pack everything nicely. By the time she saw the man walk out, her back was already drenched in a cold sweat. What a terrifying aura. Episode 195 Andres, the Five Star Chef Monica was just getting impatient waiting in the washroom when the sound of movements followed by gentle knocks on the door, came from outside. However, it was not the man's deep voice that spoke to her. Miss Thames, I came to deliver you something on the CEO's orders. The speaker had a gentle, feminine voice. She opened the door to meet with the man's accompanying assistant in a suit. Registering a huge shopping bag in her hand, she immediately felt awkward. You bought these? No, Mr. Lewis bought all the stuff. She felt delighted hearing that. 
Where is he? The assistant smiled. Are you asking for Mr. Lewis? He has an important meeting to attend, and since it might end late, he requested for you to rest first. Oh, she's so busy. Monica took a bath. Once she cleaned herself up, she hailed a taxi and went home. Laying in the soft king-size bed, she rolled around cozily. This was when she recalled something. Sitting in front of the dressing mirror, she admired that pair of delicate ear studs and the corner of her lips slightly rose. She stroked that pair of ear studs in satisfaction and turned off the light to sleep. Tonight, she slept peacefully. The next day, she arrived at the company much earlier than usual. She took an entire day's leave yesterday. When she returned to the training room, she perceived a slight shift in the atmosphere. For some reason, all the trainees were treating her with modesty. This was especially the case with Donna. If she could, she would give her a wide berth. Would, at least, her ears were cleansed. That night, when she arrived home and opened the door, warm lights greeted her from the living room. I'm home! Matthew was setting up the table. The moment he heard the door opening, he rubbed his hands and made his way to the porch. You're home! Is Mommy home? Andres poked his head out from the kitchen. As soon as he spotted her, he threw himself in her arms in glee and gave her a long smooch. Snap. He imprinted a kiss on her cheek. Thereafter, the little boy showed her a sweet smile. Mommy, welcome home. She hugged him. The little boy was wearing a cartoon apron and white flower was covering his face. He was probably meticulously preparing dinner for her. The long-awaited warmth filled her heart with happiness. She stuck her lips out and said, Once is not enough. Another one, darling. <coughs> Turning to her other cheek, he generously supplied her with yet another lovely kiss. The mother-son pair were playing with each other at the porch. How was summer camp? Was it fun? She asked, ruffling his hair. He pouted. It's not fun at all. Boring. The summer camp organized by the kindergarten mostly consisted of activities for parents and children. The other children of his age undoubtedly found those very interesting, but Andres only thought that they were childish and unchallenging. After giving that reply, he followed up with a question. Mommy, you're home really early today. How's work? Did it go well? It did. Did anyone bully you? His large eyes blinked. While the little lad asked that with an innocent smile on his face, in his heart, he was already making plans to go after those who had bullied his mommy. She, of course, did not know what was on his mind, and only smiled in return. None. Monica, come and take a seat. Andres painstakingly prepared dinner for you. Matthew quickly went over to her and took her bag and coat. He then proceeded to hang the coat on the rack. That afternoon, Andres, with his little wallet, was all ready to set off to the supermarket to buy the ingredients for tonight's dinner. His grandfather was surprised to learn that, and with his grandson being a lone little boy, he decided to accompany him. He was thoroughly amazed by this expedition to the market. Once he stepped into the vegetable section, the boy dashed headlong into the crowd with his shopping basket and maneuvered his way expertly amid the clamor. He was particular when it came to ingredient selection, ensuring that it was the right and the best vegetable for a nutritionally balanced meal. The boy could also buy the best ingredient at the most reasonable price without the need for his grandfather to step in and help. Matthew was constantly shocked by his grandson's capabilities. The boy's mother was unable to tell the difference between spinach and other greens at his age. Even he, with years of experience, was not a match to Andre's when it came to vegetable selection. Meanwhile, this little fellow seemed to have everything under his control and was able to clearly differentiate the varieties. 
he was especially surprised to find out how observant this little lad was in picking the best of the best among the greens. Those leafy greens he picked looked fresh and held no signs of damage or wormhole. When it came to selecting meat, his grandson would ensure its freshness by carefully sniffing the cut pieces and then pressing on each with the ball of his finger. He was curious and asked the little boy his reason for doing that. The little lad confidently explained, To check if the meat is fresh or not, I have to smell it. To check its elasticity and luster, I press on it. If it is slaughtered after death, then the flesh will be dark red, while the blood vessels will have purplish blood. We'll get sick if we eat that. His grandfather was tongue-tied after hearing his explanation. For fish, we must examine if the scales are tight and complete and its eyes should be protruding, bright and clear. The fish gills shouldn't be easy to flip open, and the underbelly should be bright red. If not, the fish isn't fresh too. The little lad held up a piece of fish and shared his knowledge with his grandfather. The old man had completely surrendered by then. Andre saw his grandfather's shell-shocked face and secretly wondered how he would react if he had shown his real bargaining prowess earlier. Since the family was better off, he was too lazy to bargain. Still, he would never compromise the freshness of the food stock he bought. Upon reaching home with the fresh stocks, he put on his apron and prepared a little stool for him to start cooking. From washing and picking the vegetables to slicing the meat into chunks, he did everything in perfect rhythm. His slicing skill might not be as professional as a five-star chef, but the meat pieces he cut still turned out fine and even. After sautéing, everything tasted delicious. His grandfather offered to help, but was chased away by the little lad. Flabbergasted, he stood at one side and watched the boy weave magic in the kitchen. Within a short two hours, a tasty spread was on the table. Curious, Matthew secretly took a bite of the optimum fish. Soft and tender. It was just the right taste, without being too salty or bland. This was just a simple home-cooked meal, but the standard was comparable to an expensive hotel's fine dine-in. The old man was fossilized with shock and almost moved to tears. How long did this child take to learn these? Episode 196, Mommy Does Not Love Andres Anymore. Up until then, Matthew could not get over his shock. As Monica took a seat at the table, he woodenly told her, Ah, oh, Monica, this food was prepared by the kid. Ah, oh, my Andy is the best. She dotingly ruffled his head. Her son pushed her hand away and smoothened the hair she had messed up and wistfully commented, what to do? I have a mommy who is stupid and can't cook. She replied awkwardly. Andy is smarter than mommy, and mommy is ashamed. Matthew was even more amazed to hear that and marvel at his grandson's capability, praising. It's a blessing that he knows to ease your burden at such a young age. Initially, I was worried about him cooking unsupervised, as he is still a kid, but from what I saw... It seems he has mastered the craft long ago. After a pause, he asked with a quizzical look, When did Andres learn to cook? She thought for a while and answered, Probably at six. Monica couldn't help but flinch internally. She remembered Andy busy in the kitchen and running to her with a hot cup of soup or coffee every time she returned home, feeling like a train wreck. That year, Andres was home for the year, forced to drop out of school. She couldn't help but feel crushed for letting down her precious jewel. Stupid mommy! It's at the age of four! All right, if preparing a bowl of noodles counts as cooking. She then recalled Andres preparing a tasty bowl of noodles for her when he was four. Made him feel as if he were the greatest person on earth. His greatest happiness was to make his mother happy. Mommy, let me test you. 
He blinked his eyes mysteriously. Can you guess what day it is tomorrow? His mother feigned a contemplative look after swallowing a mouthful of rice and then asked tentatively, Oh, is it a Sunday? Stupid mommy, tomorrow is a Saturday. The boy pouted with a look of disappointment. Oh, I must have remembered wrongly. Try again. Putting down his bowl and chopsticks, he propped his chin with his hands. His gently smiling eyes concentrated on her face. Is it another meet the parents session? She took another guess. No, it's an important date for me and mommy. When he saw that, by taking her time, she had guessed wrongly again. His frustrated face twisted into a mess of grievances and sorrow. She really could not come up with the correct answer. What day is that? Seeing her innocently ignorant look, he clasped his chest with a look of heartache as he made a silent protest at her forgetfulness. It's Andres' birthday! She acted surprised. Oh, yes! I recall now! Tomorrow is my Andy's birthday! The boy was fuming red in the face. Folding his arms across his chest, he made a show of displeasure with his pouting lips. Hm. Huh. Stupid mommy who no longer cherishes Andres, even forgetting Andres' birthday. His grim face started to sob after saying that. <laughs> mommy doesn't love Andres anymore. Andres is hurt. Oh, I'm just teasing you, baby. How can mommy forget Andres' most important day? It pained her heart to see him grieving and quickly went up to console him. He turned his head away and snorted indignantly. With a wry smile, she took out the little present, beautifully wrapped by her, that she had hidden in her bag, and passed it over to him. It was meant to be a surprise for him. Baby, this is Mommy's gift for you. Saying that, she planted a kiss on his forehead. Andres is Mommy's little angel. How can we forget that tomorrow is Andres' birthday? I wish you a happy birthday in advance. Dazed, he took the present from her hand. Only then did he realize that his mommy was pulling his leg. That's right. How would mommy ever forget my birthday? He bowed and looked at the exquisitely wrapped present. On the gift card were her carefully written words, Baby, happy birthday. His little fingers brushed against those neat and beautiful words. The ink had dried by now. The little lad, who just had a vacuous and grim look on his face, instantly brightened up like sunshine after the rain. He showed utmost contentment as he held his present in his arms. This was his most blessed moment. Thank you, Mommy. He was feeling so lighthearted, his little legs could not stop dangling. Tomorrow is also Mommy's birthday. Saying that, the little boy movingly embraced her face and dropped a big kiss. Mommy, you have worked hard. You brought me to life. So Andres will stay by your side for the rest of my life. I won't let Mommy suffer any pain or grievances. Every word that came from his mouth was solemn and divine. It was a sacred declaration. She beamed. <sighs> Baby is such a good boy. Mommy... Do you have work tomorrow? I think so. She paused and remembered that she had to visit the studio in the morning for her makeup trial. Dong. Hearing this, he hung his head in disappointment. She could not bear to see his dejected look and blurted out a thought. Mommy should be free in the afternoon. Oh, then Mommy, let's visit Fairyland Valley. Excited anew. He magically presented two entry tickets to the amusement park from his pocket. Fairyland Valley was a most famous and popular fairy tale thematic amusement park. This was a fairy tale kingdom that every child looked forward to visiting the most. It was built by Lego Holdings.
man's magnetic voice was deep but sweet. Sam leaned comfortably on his chest, letting himself fully enjoying his gentle explanation. Warmth spread across the study room. Sam quickly familiarized himself with all the smartwatch's functions. It had an unusual design. Not only did it include the aforesaid functions, it even had a few hidden applications. For children his age, this watch was very practical. If Stefan knew that it was one of Andre's many inventions, how would he think? It's fun. <laughs> Sam wrapped the watch around his wrist and shook it in front of his father, seemingly in an attempt to show it off. He said, treading on air, Does this watch look nicer than all those that Daddy wears? His father chuckled softly. The little boy showed such a precious smile, which radiated innocence and love. Seeing that his son was happy, the corner of his lips creased upward unknowingly. He was overjoyed. Darling, happy birthday. He stroked his head and lightly planted a kiss on his forehead. Sam's cheeks blushed. He held onto his father's shoulders and kissed him on the face, too. Thank you, Daddy. How do you want to spend your birthday tomorrow? Sam thought about it for a moment in silence before he answered in a soft voice. I want to go to the amusement park to play. Amusement park? Yeah, Fairyland Valley Amusement Park. I heard that it's really fun there. Daddy, are you free then? He went into a momentary silence. He sifted through his appointments for tomorrow and then replied helplessly, Tomorrow, my schedule is full. Sam frowned, feeling a bit desolate. Let mommy accompany you tomorrow, okay? No. Looking distressed, he continued, I only want daddy to play with me. Be good. Daddy is not free. Next time, okay? He tried to coax his son patiently. From his voice, one could tell that he was racked with guilt and self-blame. There was a project meeting of much significance tomorrow. He had to attend it. Sam glanced at him glumly. Ultimately, he nodded and gave in. He was not a willful child. However, nodding and giving in did not imply that he was not disappointed. This was not his first time spending his birthday alone. He really wanted to visit the amusement park with his daddy. He wanted to ride the Viking and the merry-go-round. In his eyes, these attractions might not hold much appeal, but if daddy were around, they would surely be interesting and fun. He understood that his daddy was busy, though. A large-scale company was under his management. He did not always have the free time to accompany him. He was not greedy. He only wanted him to spend a bit of time with him on his birthday for once. Such a thought even became a luxury to him. Sam was a little disappointed. Despite feeling so, he did not show it on his face. As a father, his thoughts were not as sensitive and gentle as that of a mother's. From a certain perspective, Andres was perhaps happier than him. At least, every year, Monica was there to play out the most important role on his birthday. Be it Andres' birthday present or her entire day schedule, Monica made preparations with utmost care. She only wanted pleasant memories to stay with the child. As such, feeling mostly regret and pity, Sam did not sleep well that night. He hid beneath his blanket with a sour heart. He wanted his daddy to visit the amusement park with him. This was the actual surprise he was yearning for. In the morning of the next day, Monica got up a tad earlier. Monica had a test shoot for her role in the movie. She had to make sure her skin was at its optimal condition and constantly worked on moisturizing and maintaining it. Her skin was closer to being dewy, which made it easier to apply makeup on it. Regardless of her look, the makeup appeared lucid and natural on her. Therefore, whenever she went out on a normal day, although she had no makeup, others would mistakenly think that she had put on a thick layer. Despite this, she still went ahead and prepared her skin thoroughly. The nanny car Drake had arranged for Monica was already waiting at her doorstep. 
She boarded the vehicle and reached the photo studio at the filming location. The early stages of the movie's test shoots and promotional shoots would be completed there. She timely arrived at the filming location. The production staff was just entering the venue in droves. Although Drake was not personally present today, the assistant, whom he had assigned for Monica, was already there in advance. The assistant was called Isabel May. She was previously Drake's primary helper. As she was reliable with her work, she was assigned to be Monica's assistant. Miss Monica Thane, it's nice to meet you. From now on, I'm going to be your assistant. My surname is May, and my first name is Isabel. Just call me Isabel. She stepped toward her passionately and did her self-introduction at the same time. Monica grinned and examined her. Isabel was very young, at 25 or 26, had a sweet appearance. Judging from her fashion style and how she carried herself, she should be a woman who did her work orderly. She entered the industry at the young age of 25 or 26. Since Drake intended to groom her as his successor, she might become a manager in the future. Monica Bean, Nice to meet you, Isabel. Please take care of me in the future. Isabel fluttered her eyes playfully and gave her a sweet smile while she held her hand. Thanks. I'll be very much under your care. This sounds too strange. Isabel sulked in a bizarre manner before saying, I've previously heard of your name, Monica. Not only do you have a pleasant name, you even look more beautiful in person than in photos. Isabel sincerely praised, her eyes overflowing with awe and affection. I'm flattered, I'm flattered. She humbled herself, feeling ashamed at her praises and marvels. After an exchange of pleasantries, Isabel suddenly raised her wrist to look at the time and said in a hurry, Oh, it's getting late. Let me take you to the makeup room. The schedule is tight, so we should prepare ourselves early. Isabel led her to the makeup room. As she guided her to their destination, she would occasionally turn to give some remarks. According to the sequence of the leads, you are second in line to do the test shoot. But since Martin is not here, you'll be the first to shoot. That's why we should hurry with your makeup. When she said that, her step suddenly faltered. Huh, where's the makeup room? Monica asked Bob. Don't you know where it is? There's a few of them. I'm not sure which one is yours, Isabel replied. She proceeded to have her wait on the spot as she asked around. I'll go ask a production assistant. Wait here for a moment. Episode 199, Acting Snobbish. As those words left her mouth, she rushed to a few production assistants nearby and tapped one of their shoulders to inquire about the location of the main leads' of makeup rooms. The production assistants were currently plagued with work. The one she had approached realized that she was just a newbie assistant the moment he looked and sized her up. She was an unfamiliar face to him, so he inferred that she was an assistant to a recently debuted actor rather than a big shot. Thus, he did not concern himself with her and dismissed her in an extremely uncaring and intolerant manner. Can't you find it yourself? I'm busy here. Stand aside. Isabel was unexpectedly left out in the cold. When she was with Drake as his assistant, even famous directors would greet her with a passionate smile on sight. Therefore, being looked down on by this lowly production assistant, she turned livid with rage. Just as she returned to her side, she went on a resentful rant. A bunch of knobs! Amidst her ranting, she spotted Pamela gracefully making her way over to them. At present, Pamela was the current it girl in the entertainment industry. Every move she made attracted attention. She was a fashionista, the it girl, the advertising queen, and the queen of scandals. She was the most popular first-tier actress of Foxcom Entertainment. However, she did not have any works worth mentioning. Her acting skills were often criticized by the media. Movies with her as the main lead largely had average reviews and terrible receptions. She was known to be a box office flop. However, she was absolutely a paragon of beauty and a femme fatale. 
Her other traits seem to be of lesser importance when talking about her stunning physical appearance. While the production assistants dispassionately chased Isabel away, at the sight of Pamela, they did a 180 change in attitude and went to her fawningly. They were full of flatteries and waited on her properly. This time, Isabel flared up. Who are these people? Clearly, they're buttering up to her and bullying us. She could only complain in subtlety, however. Having followed Great long enough, she all along believed in speaking and acting with prudence. The more words one spouted, the more errors one could make. Moreover, Pamela had a complicated background. It was best not to offend her. She might be enraged, but she reminded herself to hold in her temper. She must not get her artiste into any trouble. Monica was also a witness to their contrasting attitudes, but remained mum. This was all part of human nature. Isabel, hold down. This isn't anything much. Oh, Monica, I'm angry for you, she raged. She was truly defending herself against this injustice. The two explored the massive studio and soon found the designated makeup room. Your makeup room is here. Isabel pushed the door open and walked in as she declared this. Unfortunately and incidentally, Pamela was also in the room. Monica was a little stunned. She remembered that her makeup room should be shared with Martin. Why was she here too? Isabel thought that it was also somewhat strange. Pulling a production assistant to the side, she softly inquired, Handsome, let me ask you, isn't this the makeup room for the main leads? James had specially requested for the main leads to have their own makeup room. For this movie, Pamela simply had a minor role making a cameo. So why was she using the main lead as makeup room? It is. The assistant scratched his head and explained awkwardly. This is the makeup room for the two main leads. But Pamela said that she wants to use this one too. I suppose Superstar Martin won't be arriving anytime soon. And I'm not really in the capacity to reject her. Displeased, Isabel retorted. This makeup room is for the main leads. Can't this Mitzi use another one? Pamela's arrogant and provocative voice echoed from behind at once. What? Can't I use this room? Isabel turned around, looking fairly distressed, and met her eyes before she spontaneously pulled out a professional smile. Oh, Mrs. Smith, it's not that you can't. It's just our Miss Monica is up first for the test shoot, so she needs to put on her makeup quickly. Enough. I get it. She's a newbie so I won't haggle with her. She can share this room with me. Pamela gazed into the mirror dispassionately. She hardly looked at her when she uttered these words of sympathy. She made it seem as if she were giving alms to Monica by sharing the room with her. It was as if she had the final say on who could use this room. Isabel was so riled up, her smile stiffened. This makeup room was clearly assigned to her artist, Having taken over the room, she still dared plaster such a look of sympathy on her face. Why was she this shameless? Obviously, she was elbowing her artist out on purpose. To put it nicely, Pamela was making a cameo in the movie, but in actuality, she was unofficially selected to be one of the main leads. One of the investors valued her and was inclined to support her. Nonetheless, she was not up to James' taste. However, despite her thoughts, Isabel dared not to go head-to-head -head with her. She simply called out flatly, Where's the stylist? Hurry with the makeup! As soon as she said that, a young girl wearing a pair of rimmed glasses hurried in with a heavy bag. She was probably the stylist for this production team. She walked in and scanned the entire room before she said smilingly, I'm sorry, there's a traffic jam on my way here so I came a little late. I'm truly sorry. I'm the team stylist. The surname is Call, and you can call me Nina Call. Pausing for a moment, she eventually asked, Who's the lead? Isabel grinned. Pulling Monica's hand over, she introduced, Hello, Nina Call. This is the female lead, Monica Thames. Nina staunchly greeted her politely. Hello, Miss Monica. Just when the mood was getting amiable, uh -huh. 
Pamela, who was sitting in front of the largest dressing table, seared her throat in discontent upon realizing that Nina had neglected her presence. Nina heard the sound and turned her eyes to the source of it. Once she saw vexation and shame colored her face for a moment before she broke the widest smile. Pamela! Hmm. Come do my makeup for me. Sure. She hurried to her spot at once and laid out her makeup kit. Isabel was flabbergasted. Monica's eyes darkened, yet she remained composed. She appeared to be calm. Not a ripple of the rage she felt inside was on her face. Isabel could barely contain her anger. Did she snatch her artist's makeup room? And even the stylist? Oh, she's too much. In a minute, Monica was going to begin her shooting. This time, Isabel affirmed that Pamela was making her artiste trip up on purpose. James was known for his quick temper. Later, if he learned that her artist was still not done with her makeup, he would definitely fly into a rage. Episode 200 I am the lead, and you are only a minor cast. There was only one stylist in every makeup room. It was clear that Pamela was out to make things difficult for Monica. Isabel led her artiste to her seat first before she hastily went over to Pamela. Sister Pamela, can you let our Monica go first? She snorted indignantly. Why should I do that? Monica is scheduled to go first on the film set. Mr. Scott will be angry if she's not ready by then. The woman snorted again and retorted sharply. She only needs a simple makeover. Can't she do it herself? With that, she turned to signal Nina with a look. Am I right, Miss Cole? The makeup artist felt awkward when she saw her shoot a sharp glare. Shuddering, she agreed readily. That's right. The lead is to have a nude look, so no eyeshadow is required. Piling her face with the foundation will do. I'd better do Sister Pamela first, since styling her is more tedious. She was a lowly stylist. How would she dare rebel against someone like Pamela? Isabel was about to rebut when someone pressed on her shoulder. She looked over and was startled to see Monica smiling at her. The latter pulled her to the back and turned to face Pamela. A graceful smile, not leaving her lips. Um, Sister Pamela, you're my senior and I know that. According to rules, you have the right of way before me. The words worked like magic to Pamela. Thinking she had subdued this junior, her brows loosened. However, Monica's next words had the effect of infuriating her. But then again, even though I am new, I'm still the female lead in this film. I'm scheduled to go first for today's trial shoot on set, so Miss Cole has to do my makeup first. Pamela's smile froze on her face. What did you say? Nina, who was standing behind her, was too stunned for words. Meanwhile, Isabel tried to control her shock. I believe my message is clear to Sister Pamela. I have a leading role, and you only have a supporting role. For today, I am to go first. Her voice was gentle, and her tone composed. Every word was enunciated clearly, loudly, and confidently. The words shot straight to the woman's chest. Almost hyperventilating, she furiously got up and walked over to Monica. Did you just tell me that you're the lead and I'm just the supporting cast, so you should go first? Is there a problem? Monica countered. I'm just stating a fact. I'm truly the lead, and you're only a minor character. You! Besides, Miss Cole is originally my stylist. This is my makeup room, too. I've given up half of my room for your use out of respect. But if you also want to snatch my stylist... She pouted with a look of frustration, and then broke into a fake smile. How about this? Let's have Mr. Scott judge if Sister Pamela should go first today. How dare you use Mr. Scott to put me down? Pamela was fuming, but not wanting to damage her public image, she could only stare daggers at this newcomer. The latter did not retreat from her death glare and merely asked, Your words are interesting, Sister Pamela. 
Aren't you the one trying to put me down in reality? I'm indeed new here, and I've shown you respect. On the contrary, your actions seem to be bullying a newcomer. These words came tumbling casually out of her mouth, but the message in them was loud and clear. The woman's mouth twitched for a while as she scrutinized the newbie. Finally, she showed a sneer. <laughs> well, well, well. This is interesting. What's your back, Monica? Pamela snorted haughtily after saying that, picked up her expensive Chanel carrier bag, and rudely brushed past her shoulders on her way out. The atmosphere in the makeup room weighed down heavily on those present for a moment. The faces of Nina and Isabel, especially, had turned as white as a blank. sheet of paper.